I just want to give you um, an overview of the webinar. I will uh, give uh, the presentation to Professor Close, who is going to um, talk about the motivation of this work. Um, then I will take over again um, to describe the more uh, technical details of the combinatorial pooling from a computational point of view. Uh, and then we'll switch again, and uh, Tim will talk about the uh, more practical issues about pooling uh, in the lab and uh, explains uh, a few things about uh, how we ended up uh, doing it manually instead of uh, using a robot. Um, and finally, I will take over one more time uh, to uh, talk about experimental results and, and make some final remarks. Hello, this is Tim now. And uh, here we go. So, what we'll go through today is a summary of our work that's focused on the barley genome. And just a little bit of background barley is a, a, quite a simple genetic system to work with, and, and in some ways, very simple in terms of genomics. It's a diploid, uh, it has seven chromosomes. Um, <clears throat> along with being a diploid, it's primarily inbreeding, so we can work with uh, individuals generally that have a single haplotype, which simplifies things enormously with assemblies, etc. So what makes it a bit more complicated is, it, is its size. It's about 5.3 gigabase, about double the size of the human genome, double the size of the maize genome. It's about 36 times the size of the Arabidopsis genome, 12 times the size of rice, and uh, about nine times the size of cowpea. I mentioned cowpea here because we've used the same fundamental approach of, uh, to back sequencing for, for cowpea, but for its whole genome. Whereas here with barley, as I'll come to shortly, we focused on just a portion of the genome that's gene enriched. And uh, so barley, along with its large size, is composed mainly of highly repetitive DNA like more than 90% highly repetitive DNA. And it's this highly repetitive DNA that confounds uh, sequence assemblers, makes it, it's too repetitive for, to get a complete whole genome shotgun sequence from today's uh, uh, economical uh, short read sequencing methods. So a very common starting point where I should say that the size and the difficulty in getting the, the complete base by base genome does not stop the barley community, nor practically any other community, from going forward toward meeting practical objectives through the development of genome resources. So a very common starting point is illustrated in this slide, where here we've depicted roughly seven chromosomes, or seven linkage groups of barley. The little uh, black ovals indicate approximate positions of centromeres, and the tick marks along each linkage group are to indicate, uh, are to indicate uh, uh, SNP, uh, markers of various types. We tend to use SNPs or single polymorphism markers. So a common starting point is that someone has studied a trait and by looking at its inheritance been able to position uh, a trait determinant somewhere on the genetic map mark, uh, relative to SNP markers. So a, a question that comes up from various perspectives is what candidate genes or what genes are in this region? And there's various reasons for wanting to know that. For breeding, one might want to develop the perfect marker, a marker directly on top of the trait determinant, exactly marking the position of genetic variability. For others, uh, the drive might be the, this human instinct have that why do you go to the top of the mountain? Because it's there. Why do you want to know what gene is there? Because I want to know. I want to have a full knowledge. So there's a mechanistic drive for pure basic research interests. But the mechanistic drive actually helps lead to the perfect markers, so that the two, uh, the two motivations really go together. So thinking about what we can do, even without a whole genome sequence in barley and other uh, organisms, uh, let's consider a zoom-in view. <clears throat> if we consider, again, the linkage group with a trait and zoom in to uh, the, the red box would indicate a, the position of a trait as a position, let's say, by QTL mapping, where the precise locus isn't known, but a range with high likelihood of position is known. So one might have a, um, a physical map, and we'll come to an explanation of that in a bit more detail here very shortly, but uh, we can depict uh, a physical map here by these little vertical lines. If one's gone through the process of making 
uh, a back library, which again I'll explain briefly, and uh, joining all the pieces together computationally, one can derive a minimal tiling path, which is uh, the minimal representation of overlap, overlapping and ideally connecting segments of the genome. Then one can have this zoom in view where within your region of a trait, you might know a couple SNP markers and you might have an overlay knowledge of, of um, a physical map. <coughs> So looking again at a zoom in view, we can think about, well, what if we sequence all those backs? Uh, so we can do that. We can, and, and we have in our, in our project, sequence all the backs that we've worked with, which are a gene-rich portion, not the whole genome. The whole genome is being approached in a larger coordinated effort within the International Barley Genome Sequencing Consortium that we participate in. But our work uh, dates back some years and has focused on a concept of uh, sort of shrinking the barley genome by focusing only on gene-rich gene portion. So one can take the backs and sequence them as we have, and from that, even without having complete base-by-base, end-to-end back sequences, one can still gain knowledge about which backs carry gene sequences. So that's depicted here. One can uh, get knowledge and uh, be able to overlay positions of genes. Not, and you don't, for the purpose of answering the question of what candidate genes are in this region, you don't need to really know uh, exactly the base by base knowledge. If you just know which genes are in which backs, it, it really gets to the heart of that initial question. And that's been our goal. So, barley genome, let's review again here briefly bacterial artificial chromosome, BAC, B A C stands for bacterial artificial chromosome. Um, these are generally 100 to 150 kilobase fragments of the, of the genome propagated on self-replicating replicating plasmids within the bacterium E. coli. So they can be grown in quantity and cut into pieces and sequenced and analyzed, etc. So what we also know from studies uh, dating back more, even more than 10 years ago that genes are not distributed evenly along the, the barley genome. And I think this is true for most plants, in fact but they tend to be clustered in gene-rich regions. And so what, what, what was known and what we've observed and confirmed with our sequencing is that a bat carrying one gene, if you find a bat carrying one gene, it's likely that it carries more than one gene. So uh, finding one gene, gene, carrying, gene bearing back takes you to a, uh, tends to take you to a gene-enriched portion of the genome. So for barley, we've utilized that characteristic for this selective sequencing. Um, we first went through a process that we won't describe in detail over multiple years, identifying gene-enriched backs using genic probes. These were then built into a physical map, as depicted in an earlier slide, and a minimal tiling path was uh, calculated from the, the deeper uh, coverage uh, back physical map. So <clears throat> come to more illustrations of fingerprinting here briefly as a reminder to those who may not know how that works. So there are some pros and cons to consider. The pros of uh, what's the advantage of sequencing the genome one back at a time versus whole genome shotgun? Well, pros, you, you can be selective, as, as we have, so you, it can, you can go through a process of gene enrichment. The work can be distributed across several labs, as, as it is now in the International Barley Sequencing Consortium. Beyond the work that we've done, there's an effort to sequence the entire uh, barley genome. Our work, again, is focused on a gene-rich portion. The assembly can, carry it, be, can, carry it out, can be carried out back by back, uh, um, which helps to deal with highly, highly repetitive sequences. So a sequence that might be present, say, 200 times in the genome can't be assembled uh, in a whole genome context, but it may then occur only once within a back, and so then within a single back, it's not repetitive and it can be assembled. So you get more sequence uh, completion back by back versus whole genome. Cons of this approach, you need a back library and an overlap map to start with, and then that involves some serious time and effort and resource. But many communities have already followed this path. The Barley community has, and so have many, many others. They already have back libraries and overlap map. A con about back by back sequencing is that when you purify the back DNA, you can't get away from E. coli DNA, so you lose some of your value in sequences there, sequencing E. coli over and over again. Not too bad of an issue you can filter out with a reference data set. 
And another issue, big issue, is you need to handle a large number of individual samples. And it's the combinatorial pooling method that we've developed and used that tackles this, this last point pretty directly, shrinking the number of individual samples quite a lot. As uh, Stefano will describe later, the approach that we've used most of the time uh, made about a 24-fold reduction in the number of samples you have to handle. He'll go through that in more detail. So the outcome of the method that we've developed for uh, combinatorial sequencing of BACs leads to minimally, at least, this type of information, where if you consider uh, part of a, a minimal tolling path, you have two backs that overlap. So one gene is covered by one back, another gene is covered by two backs in this illustration. And the overlap positions between the backs defines three bins bounded by the ends of the backs, one, two, and three. And so our sequencing method allows us to allocate sequences to each bin. So the level of resolution minimally that we obtain is genes within these, um, these uh, back bins. In, in reality, the ordering is a bit more complete than that. And as time goes on and more types of information are added, we see the ordering improved as things move toward, uh, but probably never reaching exactly complete base-by-base end-to-end sequencing. But this level of sequence knowledge goes back to the slide earlier. What genes are in the vicinity or what candidate genes are in the region of interest? So this level of knowledge helps answer that question. So the, we started with one library, one Morex Barley back library. It was published uh, in the year 2000, and it was it was very very widely used for map-based cloning and marker development efforts by people in the barley community. And there's quite a legacy of published literature and work regarding this particular library. There are more Morex barley libraries that have been made now and have been incorporated into the whole genome uh, international barley sequencing consortium effort. But we focused only on this one library. And what we began many years ago was probing that library for gene-bearing backs. And so we, we found about 84,000, about one-fourth of the total library um, backs that had evidence that they were gene positive. And we estimate now that that's roughly about 70 to 75 percent of all the genes that are in this library that we've, we've caught them in this method. These were then fingerprinted using high information content fingerprinting which is a method uh, using restriction endonuclease that was developed by Ming Cheng Luo at UC Davis. And he was also the person who did the high information content fingerprinting for this project. The method essentially is that if each of these lines is one back DNA and, and the tick marks are sites of restriction enzymes, one clips with the restriction enzyme and generates a series of fragments. And so here is indicated a number string that's meant to indicate uh, the length of fragments that are generated. And so then many, um, so uh, uh, two backs are declared overlapping if they share a large number of common lengths. And this is using a method that was developed by Carrie Soderlund, who is at Sanger Institute, it's now at Arizona Genomics Institute. She developed this method called FPC, so computational assembly of, uh, of fragments to make uh, contiguous uh, associations of backs. So the word contig is the abbreviated term, the contiguous alignment of fragments. So ultimately end up with these types of contigs. A set of overlapping backs is a contig. So from a set of overlapping backs, in, if you're interested in doing what we were sequencing the contig, it's not necessary to sequence all those backs, but one can compute a minimal tiling path which ideally would run from one end of the contig all the way to the other using the minimum number of clones. So we went through that process and um, uh, in our work we ended up with 15,720 of these quote gene bearing backs uh, that were all part of minimal tolling path and when we add up their sizes it's roughly 1.7 or 1,700 megabase, or 1.7 gigabase, almost one-third of the size of the whole barley genome. And as I said, within that one-third, our, our estimates now are that, that within that is about roughly 70, 75 percent of all the genes that are in this library. So now I hand you back to Stefano.
So now that Tim has uh, um, described the uh, motivations behind this work, I, I want to address the challenge that we had in terms of handling this large number of samples, which are these um, minimum tiling uh, gene-rich bags for barley. So uh, as you probably all know, uh, if you want to use the uh, next generation sequencing for uh, this type of work, um, uh, these, um, these, these uh, instruments have a limited number of, uh, uh, fixed number of lanes, for example, the Lumina HiSeq uh, has two closed cells, each of which is uh, uh, eight lanes. Usually one, it can be used for control. Um, obviously, if you allocate one bag to each individual lane, that will be very expensive and wasteful because you will obtain so many reads, for, uh, you know, a huge um, sequence in depth of coverage. Uh, so people uh, when, to, when, when they want to multiplex or put more than one sample on a lane, they typically resort to barcoding. And we contemplate the idea of using barcoding as well. In fact, we're using it, but uh, uh, the barcoding has limitations in the number of samples it can handle, and they cannot really uh, scale to the number of samples that we're dealing with here, which is in the, in the thousands. So the idea of using a pooling, the idea of actually uh, uh, pooling bags on the same lane, on the same uh, um, uh, sequencing lane, but without, uh, um, without exhaustive DNA barcoding, we're going to use some limited form of barcoding, as I'm going to explain later. Uh, and the idea of uh, using pooling is the following, that uh, one can take uh, a bag, and instead of putting a bag in a single pool alone with a bunch of other ones, we're going to replicate this bag in a set of pools. And this set of pool is uh, carefully designed by this, this scheme so that uh, when uh, with the identity of a bag is uh, uniquely identified by the set of pools, which we call signature, which is contained. Uh, once this design is being established and, and used, uh, when we get, when you obtain sequencing uh, reads um, from, from these pools, we expect to observe the same pattern of, uh, of pools for those reads. In, uh, in other words, if a, that read um, appears in those, uh, in those specific set of pools corresponding to the signature, then we can, uh, we can assign the read back to the original, uh, to the original backlog. So here I'm going a little bit into details of this uh, uh, pooling design because if you do want to use this, uh, you will have to make these decisions. Uh, if you do choose to use this particular pooling design, which is called shifter transversal design, this particular design uh, is one of many available. Uh, we thought uh, that it would be a good, it would be a good one for us, and uh, in retrospect, we made a very good choice. Uh, many other uh, groups have used it uh, later. Uh, so this particular design is, uh, is, uh, is defined by four numbers, uh, four integers uh, uh, the, that needs to be decided as, uh, as a function of the number of symbols n there that, uh, that uh, you need to pull. So once you know one, how many pools you have, sorry, how many samples you need to be pulled n, you need to find the prime p, uh, so p is prime number and uh, a value of gamma, which is usually small, and I will tell you why later. So that p to the gamma plus one is bigger than or equal to n. Now um, there are other parameters in this design. Uh, L is the number of layers. It's uh, in fact uh, t p times p, p times L gives a num total number of pools. Um, so in, essentially, you have L layers of p pools. And these numbers together also control, with gamma, control what is called the decodability. And I will explain what this property is in the next slide. So D is a function of L and gamma. Uh, and so when you take L minus one, you divide by gamma here, and then you take the floor, and so you round it down, D is going to be essentially your D. Um, a bag is replicated in L pool, so you have to keep this in mind. You don't want L to be too big because you have to take that back and pipette it in L places. In our case, L is, uh, is seven. So you don't want these to be 70. They will, they will take too much manual labor. Uh, and, and gamma is to be small because if you take two back signatures, and so the, the set of pools where each uh, back is assigned, and you take two of these signatures, they are going to share by design most gamma pools. So for resiliency to errors, you want gamma to be small, right? ideally one or two. So, um, so given these constraints, um, we um, we look at uh, uh, we look at the problem that we had. 
and we uh, we decided that we wanted what is called a three decorable design. The reason being that, um, as you can see in this in this uh, illustration, a read R1 can either belong to one single back, uh, in this case back clone B1, uh, and in this case R1 is expected to appear in L pools. That's phase number one. Now it's possible that R2 belongs to two overlapping backs uh, because remember these backs are in a minimum tiling pattern. Uh, so it's possible that belong to the region of overlap between two backs, in this case B2 and B3. And in this case, by design, the, uh, the read will appear in two times L pools. Uh, so that's the second case. We also decided that we wanted to handle uh, case number three, where in the, the, the minimum tiling path is actually not perfect, meaning that we have some redundancy in the minimum tiling path, and now we have three backs for which our, our, the read belongs to. Uh, be, because as I said, we didn't know, we cannot establish in advance whether our MTP is perfectly non-redundant in some sense. Uh, so we, we decided that we want also to deal with a case when we have three positive backs for a read. And this is the three, the number three that we're after. So three decorable means that we want to be able to decode a read to the original back. So assign a read to the original back so that we can do assembly back by back. Uh, even in the case when a read belongs to three backs. See, if a read belongs to more than three backs, then the, the pooling design will not work, will not be able to tell you the, ori the origin of the read. So, so in some sense, case number three allowed us to a little bit of wiggle room in the, the quality of uh, our MTP. So once we decided that we wanted um, uh, the number of layers to be, we decided L and gamma. Gamma is to be small, as I said, so in this case we decided that gamma 2 was be, was okay. So we decided these uh, sort of forced us uh, to, to take L to be 7 so that we end up with the 3 decodable pooling design. Remember, L minus 1 divided by gamma is uh, the decodability of the pooling design. So once L and, and, and gamma are set, then we need to decide uh, the, the prime number. Uh, so we look at the variety of choices here that are listed in this table. Uh, remember, we had about 15,000 bags, over 15,000 bags to be pulled. Uh, so we look at the variety of choices of pro P, so 7, 11, 13, and so on and so forth. And we look at how many uh, pools, how uh, many bags would be in each pool, and what would be the total number of bags in that particular pooling design. So in this case, with P equal 13, we have, uh, we would be able to pull 2,197 bags uh, with the number of pulls being uh, seven times P because seven is the number of layers, which is 91. This sounded like a good uh, number uh, because uh, uh, sort of it's close to the, uh, to the, uh, uh, to the number of uh, locations in a typical well plate uh, using the biology labs, which is 96 well plate. Uh, and this also gave us uh, a good um, a good ratio, good uh, um, uh, num a reduction in the number of samples that uh, it had to be handled. Um, so we also look at how, many, how much time this would take manually to be done, and we wanted this to be done in in a reasonable amount of time, but it's you know a relatively small group of people. So. Uh, we estimated that P equal 13 would have been a good choice. And in fact, we ended, ended up also using P equal 11 for the very latest of these sets. And so note that the reduction in the number of samples is uh, between 17 and 24 for these two choices, which is significant. So uh, again, we started from these uh, MTP gene rich bags or barley, about 15,700, uh, and we divided them in two, into eight sets. And they're called HV3 to HV9, and then HV10 was designed with the different pooling scheme, um, sort of the leftover. Um, HV1 and HV2 were pilots, so they're not listed here. So the whole MTP bags are containing these uh, eight sets of, uh, of bags, and the first seven sets of 2,197 pulled according to the shifter transversal design with parameter 13, 7, and gamma equal 2, and HP10, which was the very last set of 1331 bags, was pulled using P equal 11. Now, once we had the set of pools, remember we, for, for the first seven set, we had 91 pools, and for the last set, we, to, we had 77 pools. Um, we, uh, we had to allocate them to the lumina flow cell 
and obviously, um, well, if you allocate one pool per lane, that will be still wasteful. Uh, so we ended up using barcoding, uh, a, a variety of schemes ranging from 13 to 16 to 20 pools, multiplex uh, via the classical DNA barcoding using custom adapters. So here is just an overview, hopefully we we'll clarify how these back signatures are designed and how, what is the computational problem behind it to be able to recover the origin or sort of the identity of a read. So remember, we, in the pooling design, in this case, this is the case where we have seven layers uh, uh, here represented by these seven numbers. Each layer has 13 spots. These are the sort of the wells where the backs is supposed to go. So in this case, back number one, which is, uh, uh, is supposed to go into uh, pool number one, pool number 16, pool number 20, 34 and 42 and so on and so forth. So with this number down here, these seven numbers are what is what we call the back signature because it uniquely identifies this back. Now, if we have, if we, if we have to encode back number two, uh, then this back will have a different signature. And as, as I said, we want these signatures to be as different from each other as possible uh, because we don't want to assign the read to the wrong back. So this is back signature for back number two. And then we're going to have different signature for back number three and so on and so forth for all the 2,197 backs for this particular uh, pooling design. Now, this is what needs to be done manually or with a robot, and uh, Tim will talk about this in a few minutes. Uh, but what happens at the other end? Suppose now that we sequence these pools, so you will obtain a file of data of reads for each of these pools. You will, have, you will get 91 files uh, from, from, from as an input. And in each uh, file, you will have reads. So in this case, suppose that we have a read that appears, quote unquote, so it, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's, uh, it's in pool number five, or file number five, and file number 17, and file number 27, and so on and so forth. How do we know which back this read should be assigned to? So the idea is simple. You simply look if you have a back which has a signature corresponding to these seven numbers. And in this case, just for the sake of this illustrative example, we do find one, uh, which is back number six. So in this case, this particular read will be assigned to back number six and later assembled individually within, within that back. So what happens if you have now a read? Remember case number two that we discussed before, I could have a read that overlaps two backs, right? So in that case, the number of positive backs for that read, the number of uh, uh, pools that contain that read will be uh, 14. And you will have, you end up with 14 numbers um, that needs to be split into two signatures whose union is that set of numbers. And in this case, again, as in this example, we have two backs, back 296 and 1179, whose back, signature, whose back signatures, when you do the union of these seven numbers, will give you the signature of the read. And then there is the most complex case, which remember we had, were dealing with three decodable pooling designs, so we want to be able also to decode reads which belong to three backs. In this case, due to the pooling scheme that we devised, uh, the read signature will have 21 positive uh, pools and, uh, uh, and we'll have to be split, we'll have to see whether we can split these 21 numbers into three sets for which each of these sets correspond to a back. And in this case, the situation is, uh, is clear. You have, uh, you have uh, uh, the reads will have to be assigned to the, the, the green back, the blue back, and the, or the, the red back, which are listed here. As again, this is, a, this is just an example. So uh, I just wanted to show you this example because I want to uh, uh, explain what is the computational problem here. So the, the input to the decoding, or we also call this the convolution problem, is we're given a set of 91 pools of reads, right? So uh, so assuming that the pooling is actually physically done and you go through sequencing, now you obtain 91 pools of reads um, and you're also given the signatures of the backs, right? So these seven numbers in this case uh, for each back and you will have a list of 2,197 of these signatures. That's the input to the problem and the output is the assignment of each read to either one back, two backs or three backs. And of course we want the assignment to be as accurate as possible uh, but at the same time, we want this process not to be too long or require too much resources, uh, computational resources. So 
the, the problem is that here we have uh, hundreds of millions of reads to, to, to deal with. So if it, if it takes uh, a few, even a few seconds to make a decision about which, where each read should go, that will take a long, long time to, uh, to finish. So from, from the point of view of, uh, of, uh, of computer science, we need an accurate time and memory efficient method to deal with large data sets. And uh, we developed a tool over the years, which is, we call the hash filter, which is available on that website, as well as from the links are also available from the, uh, from the extension web page of, uh, of this webinar. I also want to mention that we uh, recently created a small data set of reads uh, that, uh, that you can play with in some sense and using hash filter. And uh, uh, so there are some very simple scripts to use to run that will allow you to run hash filter and then assign the reads to the, to the backs. This is a very small data set for which um, uh, should be able to run on a regular machine. All right, so now this is Tim again, and I will um, uh, explain the pooling work area. So we, as a background of this, we, we um, started initially looking at robots and uh, exploring robots, talking to various manufacturers. We found that we could start around $80,000 uh, with a basic robot system and then work from there up in multiples of tens of thousands to try to adjust to give the flexibility to that we would need for the pooling method that we had in mind. And, um, and also we calculated time involved in, uh, in monitoring the robot. A robot we calculated could not work anywhere near as quickly as a, as a human uh, because of the rinsing involved uh, with reusing pipette tips for a robot. And, uh, and the expense would be high for pool. So we thought, uh, Let's go ahead and get started on our project of making pools. This was some years ago, even before we were doing sequencing. And, uh, and just get going with what we can in an ordinary lab without spending a, a lot of money. So this is our pooling work area. What we came up with was mixer. We have a person who's called a mixer. We grow, and I'll put up some illustrations, and we'll have a video coming here shortly. But we work with 96 uh, well, deep well plates to inoculate and grow cultures on a, um, a high RPM shaker with good aeration. So the cultures after they're grown and they sit on a bench, of course the pellets settle to the bottom. So the, the person who's at the mixer station simply has the job of just before plate advances on to pooling, that person goes through with a multi-channel pipette and remixes the tubes. Then they're brought over and set the, the, um, the uh, the mixed plate moves to the other side of a bench and, uh, and advances to a position next to our pooling rack, which we'll show pictures of here. So we have a person who's sitting here who's called a pipetter, um, who, at, which we call station four. A person rotates from these stations, station one, two, three, four. So the pipetter sits at station four and does the actual pipetting from the source plate into the target pool receptacle tubes. Um, we also have a, a position we call the caller. It's a person who sits at a computer terminal and advances a projection. So it projects down and, and uh, highlights, as we'll show in pictures and video, um, the target tubes that the pipetter is to pipette into. And there's another person here just who we call the watcher. The watcher does nothing but quietly watch. And if there's ever a confusing moment, this person uh, has a an eye from a distance and can say this is what happened, makes notes of errors and things like that. So um, it takes about 23 minutes per plate, as I had in that previous slide, for a 96 well plate, which is enough for one, one person does a plate, and then uh, that person swaps out and we advance through the rotation. This is a four person rotation. Um, so this is our setup. Here's a little stand built out of pieces of wood and an LCD projector computed, uh, connected to a computer terminal. The computer terminal the, has a little, uh, runs a little software program that controls the output from the projector. So it's an output that's set up to match the geometry of the work area. So it shines down on the work area and shines lights and markings um, uh, that, that uh, help the, the pooler see where to pool samples. So that we, we do the pooling manually. So an individual will sit down and take an aliquot out of, out of one tube and pool 
uh, the aliquots into seven receptacle pools that match the combinatorial that Stefano just went through. So here's the here's the uh, the computer operator whose name I can't remember from the previous slide. The uh, the caller he advances he advances the the computer and calls out something like A1 or B2 or whatever, which means the position that the that the pipetter should see as the next available position in the source plate. And then this is the pipetter pipetting and the watcher. This is a side on view of the 91 uh, receptacle tubes laid out in two rows on a rack and the uh, plate with the source materials. And here's uh, again the, the work area with the lights shining down matching up with the receptacle pools so the pooler can see where to pipette. Uh, so now we go on to a little video that we have that lasts roughly two minutes and I'll just talk over it. So this is the combinatorial pooling in action. So here again is the 96 wells and you see the lights are in a certain position that mark the target wells. So a person sets the pipette down, picks up a new one, takes an aliquot, aliquots to the next seven pools. These are standard 15 milliliter screw cap plastic tubes in, in test tube racks just fasten as a into position with a piece of tape so they don't move during the pooling. And uh, so we go through one sample after another. You can see the light over here, G10. This is getting near the end of the plate. By now the, the mixer is over on another bench getting the next plate ready to set into position. Oh, so here's A12. The next pooler has come along. And, uh, and so we're working through the next plate. And so on and so on throughout the day. It takes roughly six hours to get through uh, one set of uh, 24 plates, which would handle 2,197 backs. So that's uh, it's sort of a little uh, team party that takes place each time the pooling happens, and it's distributing the work. It's a lot, actually fairly fun. So now I hand you back to Stefano. So let me finally talk about the, uh, the results. So we have, of course, sequenced all these uh, eight sets from HP3 to HP10. I'm going to talk about HP10, which is the most recent one, um, just to give you another, an, an idea about the, num the numbers. So after the multiplex, remember we're using a DNA barcoding to multiplex a set, set of pools in the same, in the same, on the same lane of the flow cell. So after the multiplexing, we got about uh, uh, 13 million reads per pool with an average length of 92 bases. And then we had to remove E. coli and the trimming adapters and so on and so forth. We lost uh, a reasonable, um, well, not terrible amount of reads. So we're down to 9.7 reads, um, 9.7 million reads per pool with an average length of 90 bases. Now, uh, a quick uh, uh, back to the envelope uh, calculation would tell us that uh, given that the average back length in that particular set is about 128 kilobases, this will give a sequencing depth. Uh, before the convolutions are about 100 x, which is uh, uh, so be sufficient uh, to give good assembly of these uh, uh, of these packs. Um, before we talk about the deconvolution, I want to comment on something that we recently uh, discovered. Um, um, so. We, we look at, uh, we were struggling with some of these data sets, uh, for example, HV9 and, uh, and other ones. And uh, we, we were not sure why we were, uh, were able to decode or deconvolute only a small fraction of these reads. And we were, we were, uh, we were, uh, um, um, we suspected that uh, sequencing error were playing a big role in the process of deconvoluting. Uh, and and uh, sort of uh, someone, in the group suggested maybe we should try to look at this, this fraction of the data and see how we do uh, on, the, on this fraction of the data. And in this plot, uh, we, we, uh, we are, what we are plotting is we are plotting the, the number, the percentage of reads in those pools that are actually decoded to a back uh, with, with, uh, with confidence. And as you can see for different uh, sets, here we are, uh, we are looking at HV3, HV4, HV9, and HV10. The, the, the shape of these curves are different, um, but they all have some sort of a sweet spot, which is sort of a maximum uh, that is reached uh, between one and uh, maybe two, two and two and a half million reads per pool. 
so, so this suggests that actually given trying to deconvolute or decode all the data at once is actually is actually uh, not a good idea. So uh, the, again, the x-axis is the number of reads uh, per pool on average so in millions. So one means one million read per pool, two means two million reads per pool. So as I said, there is a different sets at different sweet spots. And for example, HV9 uh, maxim, uh, max out in terms of the number of decoded reads about one million reads. So what we did is uh, cut the data set into pieces and then decode each piece individually and then try to uh, combine the solutions, the partial solution to obtain the final decoding. So the, the bottom line is that uh, uh, the, if you have too few reads, of course, you don't, you cannot deconvolute because you don't have enough information. But if you have too many reads per pool, then because you have sequencing errors, then it will affect negatively the decoding or the deconvolution and you don't want that either. This result is still not published. Uh, we are writing up a manuscript probably very soon. So uh, given this approach uh, on HV10, we were able to decode about 85% of the reads, which ended up translating into about, uh, again, about 500x of coverage. Uh, just to give you an idea about the, the resources, the computational resources needed to do this job, uh, we're talking about about seven hours on a, a, a sort of average server, uh, which has uh, uh, a significant amount of RAM on it. Um, so we, we use about 36 gigabytes of RAM to do the deconvolution in this case. Uh, so it's something that you cannot do on a regular PC, but you need access to, uh, you know, a, a decent server uh, with, with a multi-core server with a significant amount of RAM. Uh, in terms of accuracy, um, uh, for, for HV10, we had some of the back signature actually were not used. So we had them in the design, but they were actually not used. So there were no bags actually that uh, employed those signatures, uh, in fact, about 20, 21% of them. And that our tool, of course, we didn't know that, uh, but still uh, did not essentially assign any read to it, or very, very few of them. Only 0.043% of the reads were assigned to these unused back signatures, which uh, let us, uh, you know, uh, they sort of suggest that, that the hash filter process, the hash filter deconvolution or decoding is actually quite accurate, meaning it does not assign a read to the wrong back, which is, of course, would be uh, uh, devastating for this whole process. So we are very confident that the convolution is accurate uh, and uh, it's a relatively efficient, you know, a few hours of uh, on the server with uh, with about 30, 36 gigs of RAM. So once the reads are assigned to a back, then we can finally assemble them. And again, the, the advantage of this approach is that we can assemble them back by back. So as Tim mentioned, if you have a sequence which is highly repetitive, maybe it will not be repetitive in, 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 inside, uh, inside a single bag, and therefore we, should, we might be able to actually assemble it. Uh, so, we, uh, so, so far we've been using Velvet um, to assemble these bags, uh, and we look at, of course, Velvet has this parameter, which is the hash length, we, so we try different choices of the hash length and, and kept the assembly that has the largest M50. Uh, this does not necessarily guarantee that this will be the best overall assembly for those choices of the hash, tip, the hash length, uh, but right now it's a sort of an arbitrary choice that we made. Uh, for those of you that, um, that are not familiar with the term M50, uh, this is the, the minimum length of all the contexts that together accounts for at least 50% of the target, which is in this case the, the back that we're trying to, uh, trying to assemble. So um, how does the assembly looks like for HV10? Well, the M50 is very high. It's, uh, uh, the average M50 over the 1,000 back assemblies uh, is a very high, it's about 42,000 base pairs. Uh, the largest context, again, average largest context over all the 1,000 assemblies in HV10 is a 54,000 base pairs, and the sum of all the context sizes is about 147,000 base pairs, which is sort of overshooting the, the average back length. So we have some inflation of, of context that needs to be resolved. Uh, we also looked at uh, how many bags contain uh, uh, genes that were expected to be contained. So to, we knew in advance, uh, give, using a different technology, uh, um, that some of these bags were expected to contain known genes. And uh, so we looked for those genes in those assemblies. And it turns out that almost 90% of those assemblies contain expected genes. So we did this by blasting essentially assemblies against these uh, unigenes. And the coverage is very high, it's over 90%. Uh, 
Um, just to give you one data point, this is just one back assembly that uh, um, uh, that uh, was uh, sequenced uh, twice actually in two sets in HV3 and HV9, uh, and also was sequenced once as an individual back. Uh, so just to give you an idea about how these assemblies compare, uh, or these back assembly using combinatorial pooling compared to uh, if you were doing a single back with uh, you know just barcoding, right? Um, so we did that. We had uh, we had one bag. This particular bag, in fact, more than more than this bag, but uh, this bag has been sequenced twice in uh, using combinatorial pooling, once as an individual bag, and also uh, you was sequenced using Sanger by John Gen Institute. Um, so we, we 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 can take the Sanger sequencing as what's you know the ground truth. It was a single content, so we expected that to be the true answer. And so how these three other assemblies compare to that particular, uh, for that particular bag? And again, this is one data point, so we cannot necessarily make the same conclusions for all of them, but we think that might be the case. So uh, this table summarizes the comparison. So for HV3, we about 600x coverage. Uh, so the that bag in HV9 at 300x of coverage, and, uh, and this as a single bag at about 9,000x coverage. When you assemble them using Velvet, uh, as you can see, you have the number of contacts, which actually is uh, uh, the minute, smallest number of contacts in HV9. Uh, the, the, this back was about 131,000 base pairs, so actually the assembly in HV9 is the closest to the true size. Uh, in terms of the largest contact, the largest contact was in the, the case of the single, but um, we, we the, as you see, the sum is very high. So, so in some sense, there is a lot of redundancy in this assembly. And we think the reason is might be because the, the, the depth of coverage is so high. So we are investigating whether uh, cutting down this coverage, right, uh, removing some of the data might actually help with the assembly. Uh, the M50, in this case, the highest is for the single. But when we look at misassembly, when we compare these assemblies of the ground truth with the one obtained with the Sanger, uh, actually, the assembly for HV9 looks the best, as only a zero misassembly compared to 70 misassemblies of the single bag. Also, in terms of the fraction of the ground truth covered by this assembly, uh, actually, the, the combinatorial pooling assembly looks much better than for the single one. And again, these are preliminary results, and I would like, you know, we're still investigating them. Uh, we use PAS to do these comparisons, uh, and, uh, you know, we, we hope that these will. Um, uh, give us very good indication whether these approach is actually competitive with single back sequencing. Uh, before we before we finish, I want to mention that these back assemblies are available. Um, the, so the, the, we have a website which is linked from the uh, webinar webpage, uh, which is called arabist-web.org. And if you click on the utilities uh, a link for Barley, uh, you would be able to type in SNPs names in this window and uh, obtain uh, uh, as as the output uh, the sequences and the functional annotations for a, a, any set of bags in, in the neighborhood of that of that list of SNPs. Um, so this is actually goes back to the original motivation of this work that mentioned uh, Tim mentioned at the very beginning. Um, we have uh, the very latest version of the back assemblies actually are not available at this point, but you can contact us and we can give you access to it. So let me conclude this uh, presentation by uh, saying that um, uh, this uh, these approach of uh, um, uh, uh, sort of uh, tackling uh, assembly and, and sequencing of large genomes uh, when they're very repetitive like barley, um, might be necessary uh, if you want to obtain high um, high quality um, sequencing. So we think that back by back might be at this point a very good uh, approach to to this to this problem. Um, but when back by back you sort of combine with next generation sequencing, then you will have this problem of of, of of handling hundreds or thousands of samples, uh, and because the NGS sequencing machines have a limited number of uh, 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 samples that they can handle, then people use barcoding, but barcoding doesn't really scale readily. And uh, so we think that pooling, this particular type of pooling that we use can be, is a cost-effective and practical alternative to exhaustive linear barcoding. And in fact, as we mentioned and we used in our work, you can combine the two. You can get the benefits of both, right? Um, 
and you get and you get a significant reduction in the number of samples that need to be that need to be uh, handled. Uh, in terms of uh, from a from a, uh, thermatics point of view, computational point of view, uh, we are pretty we're pretty confident that the convolution process, the coding process, is very accurate at this point. Something that we did not know three four years ago. Um, and that the back assembly is actually a very high quality. Um, in terms of cost, if the NTP set is given, the library NTP is given, uh, the cost is about 10 to $25 a back, which includes pooling, the preps, the sequencing, and the informatics. And as I mentioned in my last slide, the value bags and the software are available. They're linked from the webinar webpage. Uh, this work has been described in, uh, in a paper in Blouse Computation and Biology that came out a few months ago. And we have an improved decoding algorithm that uh, was uh, that is going to be presented at the workshops on algorithms and bioinformatics uh, in uh, in about a month uh, in in France. So with this, I want to acknowledge all the people uh, that uh, contributed to this work. Um, Tim, which is here sitting nearby, and uh, uh, in his group, uh, Steve, Fazana, Jaquin, and Josh did. Uh, Take, took care of the uh, the wet lab and uh, the bags and the library and the sequencing. Uh, in computer science, myself and Gianfranco Ciardo, who's uh, we we sort of supervise the computational aspect involved in the deconvolution, the assembly, uh, and our students, Denise, Matthew, Murai, Yongu, and Serdar took care took took care of various aspects of these uh, of the computational analysis of the data. Uh, we also had help from uh, uh, Francesca and Marco uh, at the uh, University of Torino to develop hash filter. In fact, they were the people that eventually wrote the tool that we're still using heavily today. Uh, in the, at UC Davis, I mean, Chen Lu took care, of, took care of the fingerprinting, high information content fingerprinting. And as we mentioned, several bags were actually sequenced using Sanger by John Jenin Institute, and uh, Jeremy Schmutz and Jenny Greenwood were the uh, people involved in this uh, this work. Uh, the support comes from uh, USDA, uh, NIFA, uh, and uh, NSF uh, DPI. And with this, I want to thank all of you for your attention, and we'll be happy to take questions.